All right, so we're looking at the assembly in a series of lessons. We started last week with the definition of assembly and getting together. And today we talk about the worship of the assembly. That is, uh, when we come together, we worship God, and there are things that we do when we do so, and it's uh, worth looking at those things. Um, as is always the case, we uh, conduct these studies by starting again, you know, um, going to the Bible, asking it, you know, <laughs> where, where did they do this and what happened when they did this and what does that mean? Um, and allow the Bible to comment on itself and build and define its own terms. Um, always, you know, when conducting studies, I try to do it this way. Uh, not go back and look at an old sermon or somebody else's sermon or commentary or anything of that nature, but ask, uh, well, what does it say about this? We know that they worshiped somehow. Where did this happen? What did they do? And go back to the text and let it tell us what they did. And, and that helps, I think, to stay honest, um, to stay open, to stay uh, available to the truth. In Acts 2, uh, 41 to 42 is where we first find the church existing because that's when people were baptized into Christ and thousands were added to the number. So that's the church. Um, already that's the assembly of God's people, the congregation of the people. And we read about them that those that received his word were baptized. There were added about 3,000. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So these are the things that the church was doing. They were devoted, and it, these are the things. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. That's telling us that this is what it's made out of. When they come together, when we assemble in public to worship God, these are the things that it is made out of. So we'll look at them. And there are some surprises, I think, um, which I don't mind telling you ahead of time. The contribution is fellowship. And the singing is fellowship, too. We'll talk about that in a bit. But I wanted to look over at Ephesians 4 first. This is something of a prelude to looking at the apostles' teaching, but it's also the case that it tells us what the church does, how it's organized by God. And it says that he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. This tells us, again, that there are, if you will, offices. Um, for lack of a better term, there's jobs to do. These are the jobs. Uh, the first are the apostles. There's 12 of those, 13 if you count Judas, who got replaced. There are 12 of them. They are not here anymore, but the writings remain, and we still rely on those writings. The prophets in the first century, there were persons who had the ability to prophesy and to speak uh, things that were revealed directly from God, in particular for the purpose of supplementing what was missing or not yet recorded for the New Testament. Now that it's here, we don't need that any longer. See 1 Corinthians 13 on that matter. But the apostles, they wrote their things down, they're gone. The prophets... They supplemented until the fullness came, the New Testament, and now that's not necessary. But we still have evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Uh, evangelist is just you, Angel, that is a, a good news, a good messenger, messenger of good news, a, a pro proclaimer of good news, which is usually translated gospel preacher. Uh, shepherds are elders and overseers, which is made plain in Acts chapter 20 when Paul summons the elders uh, 
of uh, Ephesus, Ephesus to himself and tells them to shepherd the flock among which God has made them overseers. So he uses all three terms interchangeably. But that's an office, if you will, a work that needs to be done. And then teachers. There are some who teach in a local congregation, and that needs to be done as well. That person may or may not hold the office of an evangelist, may or may not hold the office of a shepherd. Could be a woman. Um, we have very good, we've been very blessed here to have good teachers among the women uh, and our classes have been, have been good, except for mine, of course. So we have uh, today evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. This is the organization God has given to the congregation for the spiritual purposes which are equipping the saints for the work of ministry. Uh, typically, in the world, people think that it is the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers who are doing the ministry. <laughs> um, but actually, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers are equipping you to do the ministry. <laughs> we have to do it too, but... As Christians, everybody is a minister. Everybody is to be doing the work of serving. And our job is, uh, in, in my case as an evangelist, my job is to give you the tools that you need to be able to accomplish the work that God wants you to accomplish. Then, all of this leads to building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature manhood, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we may no longer be children. Big picture there is we're supposed to grow up. We're supposed to become strong and attain unity. The church is organized. The church builds itself up. Children, you know, are tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by winds of doctrine, by human cunning, craftiness, and deceitful schemes. That's not what we are to be doing. We are rather to speak the truth in love. We are to grow in every way into the one who is the head, that's Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so it builds itself up in love. There are more things to talk about here, but we will come back to them. Suffice it to say, there are words here that occur in the other passages, and it's not terribly obvious in English, but I will point it out. So, getting back to the original text, Acts 2, I wanted us to have Ephesians 4 in the, in the mind to understand there is a big picture here, and that is that we reach maturity, that we reach unity, that we grow and we build each other. How are we worshiping? Well, the way they worshiped was they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching first, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, the prayers. Um, the word the is present here in the text. Um, so I think it really is pointing out that there is a specific thing that is being done. This is These are considered the elements. Because, you know, in Greek, you don't have to supply the definite article. You don't have to say the. It's assumed. But if you do, it's considered emphatic. So I think it is pointing out that the, these are the things. That's your bullet list. And so we're going to look at these things together. And, and uh, we don't have time to look at all of them, but we'll do what we have time to do and see where we get to. And we'll stop and that will be okay. We have more to talk about. Let's start with the Apostles' teaching, which may be enough for the evening, I'm not sure. The Apostles' teaching, and we'll be looking at Hebrews 6, Acts 17, and uh, the letter to the Romans. This idea of the teaching of the Apostles is an interesting thing that I found. There is um, a difference between uh, the teaching that a person does, which is called teaching, and the teaching, uh, like the doctrine, um, the original, the source, the legit thing that is from God. Um, and 
I, it's hard for me to, I mean, basically the difference between the terms is one of them comes from the root that means to teach. The other one comes from a secondary term that means somebody who does teaching. So they're, uh, they're not really that different. But what I found in the text is that they are being used in um, mutually exclusive ways. So I think it's important to understand when we say the, the apostles' teaching, we don't mean the teaching that they did, which of course we couldn't devote ourselves to because they are not here to do any teaching. We mean the doctrine of God which was handed to us by means of the apostles, yes. But this is the word that is used in Hebrews 6, 1 through 2, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, instruction about baptisms or washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. It is interesting to note that the elementary doctrine, the foundation, which is the apostles and Christ, uh, Paul said, no other foundation can anyone lay but Jesus Christ. The apostles lay this foundation, this elementary doctrine of repentance, faith, baptism, fellowship, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, the judgment day. And these are the elementary principles of the faith, which we can talk about that one at another time. Actually, we already did. You'll have to go back to YouTube. But I'll share notes with you or study at any time, of course. <laughs> but the instruction about baptisms, or they, they tend to say washings. I'm really not sure why they do that other than that they don't like baptism. But baptism is an elementary principle, and I think most members of the church would agree it's an elementary principle. That's usually what you think of. Um, repentance, faith, baptism, resurrection, judgment day, laying on of hands, people tend to think of the uh, Holy Spirit, but that's a very specific um, meaning that really is not the majority of uses. In the majority of cases, the laying on of hands is fellowship. It means, what do you lay hands to? What do you take hold of? What do you approve? And yes, fellowship is an elementary principle, or it should be. Now, the instruction, though, is the doctrine. That's the apostles' teaching. This foundation, repentance, faith, baptism, the fellowship, the resurrection, the judgment. You can see those in Acts 2 in the sermon of Peter. Um, and, and very precisely in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. I mean, you see repentance from dead works, faith in God, instruction about baptism. Be saved from this perverse generation. Laying on of hands. What will you touch, Right. Resurrection of the dead is necessary for baptism, of course. You see all of the principles present when Peter said that. This is the doctrine. And by the way, the law uh, of Moses uh, is sometimes called the Torah, or Torah, you know, in, in Hebrew. And uh, Torah, yes, can mean law, but they usually think of Torah as teaching, the teaching. This is the teaching or the doctrine of God. So I want to think that this word really corresponds to Torah. All right. Acts 17 is another place where I just want to point out that they asked Paul to give them this teaching. And the reason we're pointing it out is here we are now, not in the Jewish context, we just finished arguing for Torah, but here in Acts 17, 17, 18, 19, we read about Paul in Athens, and, you know, they are not Jewish. But uh, he starts in the synagogue, as is appropriate, Romans 1, salvation for the Jew first and also for the Greek, 
He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout, per devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Even Epicurean and Stoic philosophers conversed with him. Some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? And my reason for looking through this is to show to go first to the synagogue and the Jews is to start with the people of God, to start with those who know Torah, who know the teachings. But there's more to this now. The Christ has come. The prophets are fulfilled. Moving from there, devout persons and whoever happened to be there in the marketplace, which included some of those who hung out there regularly, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Um, that's a totally different discussion, which we should probably have sometime. But suffice it to say, they were spending their time there looking for knowledge, looking for something they hadn't thought about or hadn't occurred to them. Um, looking for an understanding that explains suffering, that explains the purpose of the human, many things of this nature. Some said he was a babbler. <laughs> Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign gods, which is to say a proclaimer, a herald of foreign gods, which they said because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus, you know, is not a Greek name. It is Joshua. But the resurrection from the dead is something they had not really heard about. So they said, they set him in on Ari, the hill of Ares, or Mars Hill, Areopagus. Pagus is a hill. Um, and wanted to know the doctrine. The point of this being, they also are thinking about, <coughs> excuse me, how to order life, how to explain life. What should they be doing? What is it good for man to be doing and spending his time in? That's what they're thinking about. So when they bring him and say, what is this teaching? It's the doctrine. They know that it's the doctrine. They recognize it, even though some don't respect it. Actually, most of them don't respect it. They nonetheless see it for what it is. It is a body of work. It's its own thing, the apostles' teaching, which, of course, today we would call the Bible, but... You know, at that time, they're still going around and saying this and things have not been written down and they didn't have prophets with them there in Greece to supplement what hadn't been written, etc., etc. Right. But you and I see it as the Bible. They recognize that it was a body of doctrine. It was an entity unto itself. And that it was a proposed answer to their questions. Um, and if you look at his sermon, you'll see that that is precisely what Paul is doing. In Romans 6, we said we would go there to look at the apostles' teaching as well, and this is true. You find in Romans 6, verses 2 and 3, how can we who died to sin live any longer in it? Don't you know all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Immediately, <laughs> you can't keep sinning. There's repentance from dead works. Right? The faith towards God was necessary to be baptized into Christ. Teaching about baptism, resurrection from the dead. If you're baptized into his death, but he's alive and you're alive, well, there's resurrection, isn't there? And why would you hold yourself aloof from sin? Isn't it because there's a judgment coming? Acts 17, Paul concluded his lesson with the judgment day that is coming, that has been assured to all by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Hebrews 6 is right. These are the fundamentals of the faith. It's the apostles' teaching. But he also says in Romans 6, 16, 17, and 18, don't you know? If you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, your slaves are the one whom you obey, 
whether that is slaves of sin, which leads to death, or slaves of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So whatever it is that you present yourself to, whatever it is you, you obey, is your master. You are, your slaves are the one whom you obey, whether that's sin or obedience. Thanks be to God that you who once were slaves of sin have since become obedient from the heart to the standard of the teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness instead. That this also is the standard of teaching. You have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching, the teaching. My proposal is that we go with the teaching and we capitalize T. That, that's to my thinking, or to my studies on this word, is an appropriate um, accounting for the difference between the terms and the way that it's being used. The way that it's recognized by Greek philosophers as a body of doctrine, um, an entity to itself. This is the teaching. You're obedient from the heart to the standard of the teaching to which you were committed. And this is correct. When we speak of um, the fundamentals or you speak of the plan of salvation, sometimes people talk that way because everybody, everything was about a plan <laughs> in the 1800s and 1900s. Every man had a plan, you know. <laughs> but um, it's fine. It's accommodative language. Um, the fact is, you are conforming to a standard, a doctrine. When we say obey the gospel, it's true. The gospel is a thing. It's a uniform, consistent thing, and always is for everybody in every generation. So you're becoming obedient to the standard of the teaching. We all are. And you say, uh, our Emily was talking about people saying, God has a plan for me. Yeah, that's an interesting statement. It, God does not have a plan for you. He has a plan for us. The plan is the same for everybody. Obey the gospel. Having been set free from sin, you're slaves now of righteousness. Right. Then Romans 16, 16 to 17, all the churches of Christ send their greetings or say hello. I appeal to you, brothers, watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles contrary to the teaching that you have been taught. Avoid them. Romans 16, 17 is not very popular as verses go. Popularity contest in the, in the polls every year. It, it is not top 40. Um, but this is what it says in the context of all the churches of the anointed, all the assemblies of the anointed king say hello. And we finished, uh, if you've read Romans 16, and if you haven't, then do it. But in the verses leading up to this one, he's addressing multiple different congregations in Italy, you know, what we would call Italy, um, so that they're all sending their greetings one to another. And wherever it is that he is when he's writing this letter, he's sending the greetings of the brethren where they are along with him, or along with this letter to Rome, which will be distributed in, in the empire. I appeal to you, brothers, in that context, I appeal to you, watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the teaching. Avoid them. And it's plain. There is the Apostles' Doctrine. It is solid. It is firm. It is non-negotiable. And for those who create divisions, those who introduce obstacles and contradict the teaching, are to be avoided. Which he says in the hearing of all the congregations.
So that also is establishing for us that their doctrine is a thing. It is defined, it is knowable, it is what we do when we come together, we must bring these things forth. Um, and, you know, we can step back for a minute and we can comment on some of this. When, when you look at the principles of the faith, the foundation that the apostles laid in their doctrine, which is actually God's doctrine, It includes things like baptism and fellowship. And you can see in churches today, and uh, I've been accused of making this a hobby, a hobby. I'm a hobby writer. Um, and I think that you, uh, at least everybody who's here today, has heard me preach enough times to know whether or not this is a hobby that I'm constantly writing. But... Um, you can find in churches today places that do not give um, an invitation to obey the gospel. The, the sermon will come and go, uh, you know, the Bible class will come and go, the sermon will come and go, the announcements will come and go, and nobody said, somebody, you know, nobody brought forth that you should be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. I don't know how you can do that. When... It's in the elementary doctrine of the Lord. And the first century church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And the apostles' teaching included, right, repentance, faith, baptism, fellowship, resurrection, the judgment day. There's not a way for us to come together and fail to tell people how to be forgiven, to t fail to talk about repentance, fail to talk about being baptized in the name of Christ, uh, and say that we're an assembly of the Lord. We're an assembly, but not his assembly, because he's not setting the agenda. If you're not doing that, among other things. But it's an example. It's something that I noted many years ago in fact, I don't mind telling you, since I'm a hobby writer, I might as well. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a funny thing to be accused. You know, people are like, ah, that's just your, your pet peeve. That's your hobby. And like, telling people how to be saved from a devil's hell? I'll take it. Yeah, I like to tell people how to go to heaven. Don't you? What kind of preacher are you? I mean, really? Is there something wrong with that? I didn't think that there was. I thought the apostles talked about baptism and Jesus talked about baptism and every letter of the New Testament mentions, mentions baptism and that it's tied to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. I thought it was kind of important in the Bible, but it doesn't seem to be important to the brethren sometimes. But yeah, uh, I noticed it back in 90, mm, what, 90 something. It was probably 90, no, in fact, I know for sure. It had to be 92, 93. Um, yeah, it had to be 92, 93. I don't know whether it was fall or spring, but it was my first year in college at UT. <laughs> uh, and I went to uh, hear a, um, Ricky Jenkins talked he did a gospel meeting at uh, Cedar Park I went to go listen to him and it was Friday night and the house was packed and it wasn't small back then either and uh, he gave no invitation whatsoever no mention of baptism no mention of repentance nothing um, which I thought was a glaring oversight and I brought it up to I didn't get to go with him, but I went with some uh, one of the other preachers in town, for instance, Simons, and then I brought it to his attention. Hey, well, how come he didn't talk about baptism? This is a gospel meeting. He doesn't know, you know, and for instance, well, I'm sure he knew his audience. Like, he doesn't. Well, how do you know that? Well, because I've never met him before. <laughs> he didn't know who I was or where I was from or whether I had obeyed the gospel. 
And he said, well, I think you're making a big deal out of a human tradition. Wow, Princeton, I can't believe you. But he was that way. So I asked Tom Roberts about it. He said, you know, here's Ricky's address. Why don't you send him a letter and ask? And so I did. <laughs> and, you know, he wrote back and said, uh, I wish I'd kept the letter, but I was a kid. I didn't, you know. But he wrote back and said, are you sure I didn't give an invitation? I, I thought that I did. Is there a tape? And, uh, you know, my dad told me that I needed to work on that. Which is interesting. Um, it's not really an answer, is it? Also, it's more than not an answer. It's a lie. The truth is that in the 80s, when he was preaching in Del Rio, he wouldn't give invitations there either. And it was a problem for the congregation, but he insisted it was a human tradition and he would not be bound by it. So that's interesting. Why would he say, oh, I thought I had, and uh, yeah, my dad told me I needed to work on that. Of course, his dad is Jesse Jenkins. <laughs> I'm sure his dad did tell him he needed not to be doing that. Jesse will tell you how to be saved. <laughs> For all of his things that he's got off on, he will tell you how to be saved. So yeah, you got to look at that and say, what is happening here? We say, well, that's a human tradition. Okay. Uh, in a sense, it's a tradition in that um, it's being done in a specific way, in a specific order, at a specific time, by a specific person. In our case, we, we give them at the end of the sermon, it's the evangelist who does it. Um, yeah, that's a tradition. It doesn't have to be done that way, but it does have to be done. <laughs> I don't have to do it. The song leader could do it. In England, that's what happens. The song leader gives the invitation. Famously, an American went to preach the gospel there and gave the invitation at the end of his lesson, and the song leader was mad at him because he had stolen his thunder. <laughs> um, that's fine. Song leader can do it. Elders can do it, person giving the announcements, you know. But I don't see how we come together and worship God and don't tell people how to be saved from their sins when baptism and repentance and the judgment day are fundamental principles of the teaching, the apostles' teaching. So, just so you understand, it's not a hobby, it's not a personal vendetta. I still have no problem with these people personally. Um... I'm saying it's an example of a departure in the faith, a departure from the fundamentals, the easy things. And this is an assembly that belongs to the Lord. We are assembled for his purposes, or we're not. And when we're not doing the things that the apostles were doing, we're not saying the things the apostles were saying, we're not the assembly that we think we are. That's what I'm getting at. So it is very much tied to what we're saying in the Acts. That's not devotion to the apostles' teaching. So we'll have to come back. That's just one example, of course, but it's a good example, I think, that illustrates what happens and how people get there. Nonetheless, we will pause here and come back for more at the next opportunity. Um... Fellowship, again, does include, of course, fellowship, but it includes um, the contribution and it includes the singing. The word contribution, actually, is the same word for fellowship. So that's an interesting thing. We'll talk about it. Um, I didn't realize that until recently. And the idea of the spirit being shared by means of the songs is also the word for fellowship. So those things are part of what Acts 2 would call fellowship. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that. Thank you. If today you are not a Christian, as we mentioned earlier, you need to be one to be ready for the judgment day. There is coming a day on which God will judge the living and the dead, and it will be right. We will be judged according to what we have done. Every one of us, we will give answer for ourselves, 
cannot answer for anybody else. Nobody else can answer for us. Mom and dad cannot step in on your behalf. Brother and sister, husband or wife, nobody can step in on your behalf. You will answer for yourself. What have you done and why have you done that? Or what have you failed to do and why not? There's no reason for that to be a surprise or something unpleasant for you. If you will obey the gospel of Jesus, you'll have the perfect answer. We are ready to help you in baptism for forgiveness of your sins if you realize your soul's jeopardy and your great need. Today, if you are a Christian who has not lived right, repent, make things right with him. Look to the example in Acts chapter 8 with Simon, who was told to repent and pray that he might be forgiven, and who asked for the prayers of the congregation on his behalf. If you need our prayers, if you need to obey the gospel, please let the need be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected.